Let's take a look at Lazy Mouse and its uh, extra feature, Backtrack. So what is Lazy Mouse all about? Let's just select the standard brush and in fact let's reset all of our brushes. Okay, now if I select or let's say if I just stroke along the surface, I'll get a clean line although occasionally a hiccup, a little bit of a hiccup there. And th there's definitely some bumpiness to that. Now this gets aggravated if I come in and I select a small alpha. Things can become difficult. If I'm pushing in, the line can get out of shape and uh, things just get, it, it gets very nervous looking. If I turn lazy mouse on, then this allows me to take one line and drag out a nice clean edge. Let's just turn alpha off so we can see that a little better. Notice how that's a cleaner line because what we're doing is averaging out our stroke. This can allow us to get in and create graphic effects with a lot more smoothness than if we were trying to do that by hand. So the function of Lazy Mouse is to allow you to trail the stroke behind your cursor. So as you make a turn, it's going to adjust and kind of average out that curve to create a smoother curve. The amount at which your stroke is trailing behind is set by lazy radius. So if we set that all the way to 100, the stroke is going to curve or trail behind much further. And then you're going to reach points where it just has to delay and catch up. So by default set to around 30 is a pretty good number for smooth effects. You can also lower this all the way down to 1 and then it's pretty 1 to 1 but it's still going to be smoother than not using it. Let's return that to 30 and then let's go back to that small stroke that we were using. That's going to help us illustrate what lazy step does. Notice that there is space between the, the dots. Essentially your alpha is being just placed dot by dot by dot by dot by dot. And they're essentially 0.25 units apart. If we set this to say 0 0.01, then as we stroke on the surface, you're going to see no separation between them and you'll see nice clean lines. Sometimes when we're working on a model and trying to deal with um, you know high-res model but still keep smooth form then uh, the stroke or the standard brush can start to break down and you start to see uh, all of your um, all of the dots. Let's take a look here in the eye area. We're at about 2 million polys. Notice I'm not using lazy mouse, but see this dottedness that I'm getting? That happens when your system is just taxing the resources and ZBrush is unable to kind of keep enough uh, enough dots in the stroke to keep it smooth. This is where you have to force ZBrush to set a certain distance between each stroke. That's where Lazy Mouse comes in. And so if you need a nice clean line, you can set Lazy Radius all the way down to uh, 1 and set your Lazy Radius below 0.1. And then no matter what you do, ZBrush is going to enforce a nice clean line. If it takes longer to make the stroke, then it takes longer to make the stroke. But ZBrush is still going to enforce that clean, simple line. The other features in Lazy Mouse that we want to just make a note of are relative and lazy smooth. Uh, if you're going to use or adjust lazy smooth, just know that the primary thing it's doing is just either increasing or decreasing the effect. So it's just kind of smoothing out how this works. Let's set this all the way down to zero and see if we even uh, notice. 
and then set it all the way to 16 and repeat. This is going to be one of those features that you only need in some instances and I have not actually ever needed to adjust it. Some of its behavior you could deal with or fix with a quick shift to smooth things out. The other feature that we want to be mindful of is relative. So relative is going to keep all of these features relative to your brush size. Let's just turn that off. and then set our lazy steps a little higher. Okay. Notice that as we move along, the lazy step is staying perfectly in sync. So relative is off, which means that this is going to use an absolute value, the distance between these. But as soon as we turn relative on, then the value between them is going to become relative to your stroke. So let's lower our draw size. And now, based on our draw size, we're able to adjust the spacing. If we turn relative off, then no matter what our draw size is, it's still going to lock to that one placement, that, that absolute value distance between them. 9 times out of 10 you're going to want uh, relative to be on because that's going to allow you to create a more organic spacing, more natural spacing uh, between whatever it is, between these uh, objects that you're placing down. Uh, in this case these kind of uh, ridges, things of that sort. The next part that we want to take a look at is backtrack. Let's just use a sphere for this. Set that to matte cap gray. Set the color to white. If you ever get some strange color, just make sure you set the color swatch to white. Okay, we're in the standard brush. Alpha is off. Backtrack is now on. Notice that lazy mouse has to be on for backtrack to be active. Let's turn symmetry off. And there are four types of backtrack. There's the plane, the line, spline, and path. By default, the first one that we select is plane. And plane's goal, its main function, is to just take the effect along one plane. Now, with the standard brush, which is a part of the old ZBrush, we're not really noticing too much, or at least it strikes us as strange. The backtrack feature is really designed to work with the planar brushes. So let's see what happens if we select the planar. Backtrack plane is on. And we start to cut away. Or nibble away. We're going to have to increase our draw size to get a larger piece cut out of there. But what determines how large that piece is that gets cut out? There's two things in this case. One is samples, sample radius. If we increase that, then it's going to sample a larger area of our circle, which is going to allow it to push deeper into the model. So th instead of just sampling the surface, it's going to sample all of this area. And then that puts the center somewhere around here, the center of the effect, which is what we end up snapping down to. So samples does that, but then also the other thing is depth. And this is where uh, the whole depth feature really came to the surface. Now watch as I l uh, increase, I was going to say lower, but watch as I increase the embed. The thing to keep in mind is that Z add and Z sub determines whether or not this goes up or down. Watch what happens when I turn this to Z add. Well, it just switched up to the top and then we do have to lower the value. So by default Z sub is on, which is just inverting this. Okay. Now we have zero, 
And as we adjust the surface, that's what we get. Just a, like a little nibble, not much. Set that embed a little higher, and boom. Gets massively aggressive. Boom. Just cuts away. That's the nature of the planar brush. As you come in to the planar brushes, and let's say you uh, select planar cut, the only difference that this brush has with planar is that its embed value is set to 10, whereas planar by default is set to 0. Now let's come into the planar brushes and select a few others. Let's check this planar cut thin. This is a really amazing brush. Now it's doing something entirely different with the depth. It's not just using embed, but it's using something called depth mask. So watch as I adjust the surface here. I'm going to increase my draw size. Notice that this is relative to your draw size because it's relative to the area that's being sampled. But planar cut thin's goal is really just to cut out a cross section. And that is what this depth mask is doing. Let's turn depth mask off. You can see it goes back to a perfect circle. Turn depth mask on and you can adjust this back to a circle or just say I want to cut in back to a circle or I want to just kind of limit the effect to a cross section and that cross section can be deep or try it up above. Now this is where playing with features inside a ZBrush like this can get a bit confusing because there's no effect. The reason why is because it's above the surface. Let's just intersect it a little bit and you see I actually just cut that surface off. So keep this in mind, this is a really powerful tool, but where you really see this, or one really uh, cool use of this, is when you get in to create some kind of terrain. Let me show you a really quick example of that. We're going to go to um, uh, clay tubes, select the uh, spray stroke, and just create a really quick cliff terrain smooth this out because I don't want to use clay tubes for that texture I just wanted to use clay tubes to get me a couple of planes now we can come in as we've done before and use things like trim adaptive which are going to help us define nice clean straight planes we can come in and use some of the planar brushes like say planar cut and just chop off areas really good to establish a couple of simple planes and then once we have something kind of roughed in then we can come in over the top of that with planar cut thin and then even come into stroke and now we're using spray stroke and that's going to help create a really cool natural effect. So let's lower the draw size. Check our polygon count. I'm going to lower that. Notice the striations that we're creating. and almost natural geolog geological uh, striations that are just being added in there. Everything depending on the direction of the first surface you click on. So from a side view, my striations are going you know, up and down. Here, if I select towards the top, then they're going totally different directions. So this can be a really cool way to create some cross-section texturing uh, which I've only really found a purpose for in uh, in rocks like this but when used creates a really nice natural effect you can also use it for some hard surface stuff as we've seen in some ZBrush uh, Pixelogic videos where they're able to kind of say flatten out um, a, a wheel well or something of that nature and in that case they're just def definitely using the dots stroke so now 
But the other backtracks that we have access to, let's take a look at um, line. But first, I'm going to switch back over to uh, planar cut. This is really the this is the default behavior of the planar brushes. And again, its basic function at this point was just to serve as a cutting a cross section out. It samples the first normal that I pick. Notice it's using once orientate. And then conforming everything to that. Now, if we wanted more control and we wanted to specify the direction of the plane with more accuracy, instead of just finding some surface that's facing that direction, that's where we come in and we select line. And now we click one point, drag out, and then drag back. So again, the behavior of planar uh, or backtrack is you click one point, drag out, and as soon as ZBrush detects that you're moving back along the curve, then it'll switch into action mode and start to cut a plane into the model. That will essentially be from point A, where you started, and point B, where you turned back upon the stroke. You can also use this with Alt. I'm pressing Alt right now to build that ledge up and just kind of get in and define this a little bit. Define some aspects of it. Now before we go too much further, let's stop and take a good solid look at the brush system and look at features like depth in detail and really understand what samples and uh, some of these other features are really doing behind the scenes.